Good evening, everyone. Tonight, I would like to share with you a medication for those that cannot forgive. Do you think forgiveness has something to do with our health? I do really believe that we are living in a, in a world that is full of injustice. Because the subject is called the paradox of forgiveness. Who is the paradox? Jesus Christ is a friend of mine. I know him personally. He's the one that pulled me off the valley of shadow of that some years ago. And today I live by borrowed grace. I live a life that is not mine. And that's why the entire purpose of my presence here is to share with you the beauty of his life and the beauty of his character. Because he is the law. And he is the mercy. He is the justice. And he is the grace. In him dwells the fullness of the greatest paradox of the universe. The lawgiver and the one that forgives people is the most important man that I want to talk about tonight. Okay. I have a text from Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men uh, is fully set in them to do evil. The, the Atlanta flight is packed. Here is a mother with two little beautiful kids and the father that is very busy. And uh, she tried to, to calm the little boy, five years old, Max. And she says, honey, please, we're in a plane. Would you be so kind to be nice? And the boy says, don't talk to me when I talk. The boy, five years old, will tell the mommy, don't talk to me when I talk. And I will address a question to the justice. I would address a question to the police officers towards whom I have all my respect. Sir, wouldn't have been better to allow me as a father and a mother to correct my children in order to avoid them to leave my house in shackles? If the parents will be allowed to do their job, the prison will not be full with, with our children, with my sons and my daughters, your sons and your daughters. Something is strange in this society. And we do have this satisfaction how the justice and mercy operates in the system we live in. It's interesting, Alessandrina Ocasio-Cortez justifies shoplifting. In one of her statements says, so they go out and they need to feed their children, child and have no money. And they are put into the position where they feel like they either need to shoplift some bread or go hungry. People are going to steal cell phones, iPhones, vodka from these liquor stores. So these people don't have a baby. They are not looking for the bread. I do believe that she does a proper answer, but makes a, a wrong application. They are not hungry for bread. Because if you want bread, the Bible teaches us the following. I say unto you, ask and ye shall be given. Knock and it shall be opened to you. The Bible doesn't say shoplift or rob and it shall be given to you. Seek and it shall break the doors and the door shall open for you. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says if you are lacking bread... Knock to the door, ask to your neighbor, and the bread will be provided to you. Our mind is so twisted in this generation, my friends, that we do not have a concept how in the universe we can reconcile the justice and mercy. Uh, I was a pastor, I, I was born in Romania, for those that did not come last night, I have to do a brief intro. Born in a communist country and I immigrated to Canada to learn French. I came to the United States to learn Spanish. <laughs> and I do. Yo creo que la lengua hispana es la lengua de cielo porque Dios habla español también, ¿verdad? Yes, so in Canada, bendiciones hermanas. So in Canada, I was a pastor in Toronto Church of uh, in Etobicoke City. We received a praise uh, and a, a, a gift, 
a recognition, it's a piece of paper, from the city of Etobicoke for one of the most beautiful floral decoration. I can give you the link and you can provide. Today they don't have a floral decoration. That was in 2000. And it's interesting, me as a pastor, I have the duty to protect the building and protect those that are coming in the building. So here is a rainy day in Toronto and all of a sudden my wife is looking through the glassy window of the entry and guess what? A 13, 14 years girl is coming to shoplift <laughs> our flowers. The city hall gave us a piece of paper for one of the best floral decorations. And now a girl, an intruder, is coming to take our flowers. I don't want to say steal flowers, because usually we don't steal flowers, yes? We just take them. And I'm with the grace, and my wife is with the law. And here is the subject, the paradox of what? Of forgiveness. So my wife is looking through the window, and she sees the little girl... She doesn't break or uh, uh, unplug the flower. She takes with the roots and everything. She has a bucket. She has tools. She professionally designs to take her flowers and bring them somewhere else to plant. And my wife says, are you sitting here and you do nothing when the church is robbed? Wow. You know, it's very hard for me as a pastor in this situation. It's supposed that I should bring the girl in the church, correct? Because I'm a Christian pastor. But now, the justice that I love, which is my wife, she says, go and fix the problem. How I fix this problem? Tell me. My son, Jordan Daniel, when he was little, I said, Daniel, do you want to uh, follow dad to be missionary and to bring souls to Christ and talk to Jesus? And I said, yeah, dad, I want to become a missionary like you, but I want to become a policeman too. I said, ah, how do you reconcile the police and preaching? And, oh, no, then you don't understand. First, I preach to them. If they don't listen and they don't want to have Jesus in their lives, I will put them in jail. <laughs> so when my wife told me, go and fix the issue with the girl that is stealing flowers from us or taking, assuming, borrowing flowers from us, I remember my, the words of my, my son. Now I know the genetics. Now I know how my son, where did he get this information that he will put them in jail? Now I'm, I'm the time to apply justice, which I love, which is my wife. So I'm going outside and talk to the girl. I said, hi. The girl got so scared, she dropped the tool, bucket, flowers, and she ran. I said, Mama Mia, I just said, hi. I didn't say anything else. Hi. And she ran. She's a minor. I'm going to the house to see where she lives. Three houses to the left. There is the house. And the mother, it's a big, strong lady. So I'm going there. And the woman is planting the flowers from the church in her garden, which is fantastic. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, you take the flowers, you take Christ from the church and plant Christ in your church. It's beautiful, okay? So the lady thought that I'm coming to fight. I'm coming with the justice to defend the flowers. She's looking to me and says, what? I said, ma'am, how are you? I'm, I'm, I'm deeply sorry for, for scaring your daughter. It was not my intention. Please, I, I know that she tried to, to, to borrow some flowers. But she doesn't need to. Please come and take as many flowers as you want. And we will plant others. And by the way, we have a wonderful program in the church. Sabbath evening, uh, Sabbath morning, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have children class. She will love the Sabbath school in our, in our church. I tried to invite her. We have lunch we can we are neighbors we live in the apartment of this church so we can get friends so no problem take take you come and help the girl and take as many flowers as possible the woman as she was with a shovel in her hand <sighs> okay <laughs> I'm sorry well, I'm sorry, you know, we should not have taken flowers from your church. No, 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 don't worry, don't feel so. I mean, it's our fault. I, I, I deeply apologize for your daughter coming. You know, I, I produced unnecessary stress to her. So we got friends. When I came home, my wife says, what did you do? <laughs> I said, uh, mom, they come back 
What? Yeah, they come back to the church. I invited them to come to the church to have a good lunch, vegetarian lunch in our church. And they may take more flowers and they may bring more flowers. They have more kids. Every child, every daughter of that neighbor, it's a flower, correct? You see, brothers and sisters and friends, I share with you a practical lesson of life. Oftentimes, we try to save the box and we forgot about the merchant's eyes. We try to save the flowers and kill the souls. How is forgiveness working in this world? I want to I wanna go a little bit farther because our time is against us as always. Justice and mercy, law and grace. This is the greatest paradox of the world. How can we reconcile law and grace? How can we reconcile justice and mercy? We do have problems. We do have situations in which the boy does some silly things and he repeats those silly things and I as a father says, tonight you will sleep in the basement. Oftentimes, we as a parents, we try to portray ourselves as an icon of perfection. And always we give this lecture to the kids. Son, I don't like the way that you talk. Son, I don't like the way that you act it and da da da. But I, I see in my son, me, at his age. Yes, yes, Dad, I, I know that I was wrong. Please, please, can you do sugar down that justice? No. And all of a sudden, the boy tried to reconcile the justice and mercy. Dad, I don't want, I don't want to ask you to, to void the penalty, the, the correction to sleep in the basement. But I'm, I'm a, I have a request. Can you come with, to sleep with me in the basement? You see, paradox of forgiveness. You blend justice with love, compassion, mercy. At the cross of Calvary, God died on the cross, embracing or permitting justice to embrace mercy. And guess what? Who has the higher speed? Justice or mercy? Mercy. If justice will come to you before the mercy arrives, you are dead meat. I am dead meat. But praise the Lord. The one that created our human chemistry. The Lord knows exactly that we need mercy and justice together. Simon Wiesenthal, he is one, number one, war criminal seeker or finder. Over 1,100 war Nazi criminals have been found by Simon Wiesenthal. He tried to apply justice. You kill Jews, you must die. Is this according to the law? Yes. But what is interesting is that he gets sick looking for these bad guys to find who killed those good guys. Our brothers, Jewish people, they were killed by this uniform. After 10, 15 years, this gentleman, Simon Wiesenthal, gets sick. And he goes to best, the best doctors. What do I have? They check, to, 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 nothing. Cholesterol, no. Heart problems, no. Panic attack, no. What do I have? Sir, we cannot find the reason why you are sick, but you are really sick and you are going to die unless something changes in your life. Well, you're a stupid doctor, don't get on. I'm going to change that. You know, second opinion as we think. The second doctor told him the same thing, the third, the fourth. Then he said, man, I have to ask the religious people. The religious people went and he said, look, uh, do you have some graduates? We have psychologists. Okay, is there something, a trauma in the past? You are prisoner of your own memories. And then he said, wow, yeah, 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 I am. He was hating people. Justice, passion, anger ravaged his health. I want to kill all the Nazi people. I want to bring them to justice. Okay, justice is good to be applied. No question about that. But when justice transforms us in something else, that's not good because it affects our health. And then uh, he says to one a Christian theologian, look, uh, I remember we, I just uh, was in Poland and I was in a hospital. And a German SS officer came there dying 
wounded to death, a German Nazi SS officer. And all of a sudden, a nurse is calling, I need a Jew. Is there someone in this hospital that is a Jew? Because I have a Catholic German, and he wants to ask forgiveness from a Jewish man. They found Simon Wiesenthal in the hospital. The nurse brings him before the SS officer. And the guy, barely holding his hand, says, forgive me, sir. I am a Catholic and I love God. I did things that I deeply regret. And he says, the Russians were coming. We shut down the building with three levels, three floors. We put all the families, Jewish families, in the building and we burned them alive. We were surrounding the building and those who tried to jump over the window, we will kill them. We will shoot them. And I did something terrible, he says. A father with a child in his hand, in his arms, with a wife, the mother, jumped with the back towards the window. And the father tried to jump to the position where the baby at the impact with the soil, the body of the father will be a shield. The father tried to do ultimate sacrifice to, to save the baby. And the German SS officer says, I took my gun and I shoot the father and the son. This is a horrible experience and I, I deeply apologize if I'm too graphic, but that is what war is. And the German officer, feeling his pulse going down, tells, look in the eyes of Simon Wiesenthal, saying, please, I beg you, I don't want to go in inferno. You know, they believe in that. I don't want to go in hell. I want to be forgiven. Please, would you be so kind to grant me forgiveness in the name of the Jewish people that I tortured and suffered? Simon Wiesenthal was so shocked about that. He pulled in rage his hand and says, no. And now, after 20 some years, he shares that with his theologian, psychologist, whatever it was. Yes, I could not forgive that man. I hated him so much for what he did to my co-nationals. It was just, it was according to the law. But that was rattling his health. Get revenge if you want to be happy for a moment. Forgive if you want to be happy for eternity. And this is the choice between two descriptions. Simon Wiesenthal and the following example. Revenge. And Simon Wiesenthal took proper revenge. Over 1,100 war criminals got in South America, brought to justice. But if you want to be happy for eternity, you have to forgive. This is a friend of mine from Colombia. His name is Jose y Pedraza Yate. He was five, six years old. His father was a member of one of the uh, drug cartels in the city of Medellin in Colombia. You remember Escobar. And, you know, there are different uh, cartels, influences. In one morning, a group of people from the other cartel came and emptied a cartridge of bullets in his father's body while he was asleep in his bed. And that happened in front of this man. And he says, Brother Livio, for 17 years, I was seeking that man that killed my father. And I want to kill him. But in all these 17 years, somewhere in time, I met the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ helped me to forgive the murderer, the killer of my father. It took me another 17 years to find the killer and tell him that I forgive you. He met, and in fact, he said that the guy that killed his father got the Bible too, and he was in the process of receiving Christ in his life. And he says, please forgive me. He asked forgiveness and no, I forgave you because I met Jesus. Now, quick question. Was painful for a five, six years old boy to see his father murdered before his eyes. Is that, is that something uh, that will be a trauma for life? Yes or no? 
Yes. Was Simon Wiesenthal justified to seek revenge against those who killed his co-nationals? Yes or no? Yes. What makes the difference between them? The difference that is one forgives the enemies. The other one cannot. And I want to tell you, it's impossible for our human nature to forgive individuals that did evil to us. In our human nature, it's impossible. I was in Canada. Toronto has a radio station, CFRB 1010. In 2000, 2001, uh, they start to discuss about peace in Middle East. They say, how can we bring peace in the Middle East? You call them online. They have somebody that filters your thoughts. They say, are you okay with the peace in the Middle East? Sure, I am. Okay, we, you are free in line. So you get there and you talk to the, the moderator. And guess what, my friends? They ask, do you agree? What is the solution to bring peace in the Middle East? Bring back the Prince of Peace in the Middle East. When you bring Jesus Christ... In Middle East, you will have peace. You know, there was a reply later on. It says, but Christians have Christ. At least they pretend that they have Christ. And they rage wars. They created more wars than the rest of the nations or cultures. I said, yes, not Christians. The church that is called Christian church. It's a big difference to be the church and to be with Jesus Christ. 1900, this book, Christ Object Lesson, the author says, nothing can justify an unforgiving spirit who is unmerciful towards others, show that he himself is not a partaker of God's pardoning grace. So it is not in our nature. I wanna ask you a question. Who do you consider would be the greatest hero in the world. What are the qualities we have to have in order to be the greatest hero in the world? To have big muscles, to be the best sniper, to be the, bo uh, the best uh, boxing uh, uh, killer or something. The statement is amazing. Who is the great hero? Who is the greatest man of the world? The strongest man is the one who is sensitive to abuse. You know, and he can forgive, restrain his passions, and forgive his enemies. Such people are true heroes, my friends. And do you remember what the Lord says? With what type of judgment you judge, you will be judged. That's the measure. If you want to apply justice with no mercy, that is the way that God will judge you and me. When Jesus was on the cross, he proved himself that he is the paradox of forgiveness. On the cross, he was asking the Father to forgive the people that were scorning and, and mocking him. Forgive them, God, Father, because they know, they don't know what they are doing. And this is the very essence of our salvation, my dear friends. The Pharisees brought a woman and says, the law says that the woman must die. What do you think? The Pharisees didn't understand that they stay face to face with Jesus Christ. The author of the law and the author of mercy. Jesus was the great paradox of the universe because he was the lawgiver and he was the one that forgives. And that is the big utopia, paradox. And the Lord Jesus Christ does not talk to them much, but he starts to write with a finger on the ground who these people are, what are their sins makes, made in darkness, my friends. And here is the answer. If you consider yourself that you are the justice, take the stone and kill the woman. Because in order to apply justice, you must be perfect. But if you are a dirty and miserable individual, and in the light time you put a tie like me, and you pretend to be holy man, that's called hypocrisy. My dear friends, there is a difference between perfection and perfectionism. Perfection is the character of Jesus. Perfectionism is the hypocrite that is seeking perfection in others, neglecting his own character. In reality, there is a difference between character and reputation. Reputation is what people know about me. Character is what God knows about me.
So what are you interested in? Reputation or character? What should be our concern? Guard your character and God will take care of your reputation. Amen? That's the best. And guess what? When they were convinced in their conscience, look at that. When they were convinced that this is the law, they run away and the woman was alone. And then Jesus says, woman, nobody is persecuting you. Nobody is accusing you. And the woman is, 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 is looking to Jesus and says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He was the justice because he was perfect. And the justice says, I do not condemn you. But she committed adultery. According to him, she should have been stoned. But he says, go. I mean, I forgive you. Sin no more. Meaning change your life. You see, brothers and sisters, this is the very definition of forgiveness. It's a paradox. But I believe that the Lord will come soon and this world will end. It never been like today. I was born in 1969, communist country. When the communists collapsed in East of Europe, we thought that that is the end of the world. And it's not. But when I saw the new world order established in our world today, open business, I realized, wow, that's the time. When the Lord will come and say, hey, this is my planet. And these are my people. That's why it's very important for us to understand how we prepare ourselves. What is our relationship with God? How can we reconcile with him? How can we, how can we change our lives? And how can we change our character? Because it's important to be ready. You know, there was a father that uh, saw that the boy start to take one dollar from his wallet once in a while. And the boy said, well, daddy will not find out that I take one dollar from his wallet. One dollar, what is one dollar today? Nothing, you know. I uh, remember three years ago, uh, a dozen of eggs was three dollars and a half in Virginia, Roanoke, and now it's nine dollars. So what is one dollar? Nothing. So the boy was stealing, shoplifting one dollar from his father's wallet, okay? And the father notices and says, son, if you will continue taking money from my wallet without my authorization, I will take a needle and I will stun you. The boy got scared until Thursday. And I said, ah, maybe dad will not do that to me because he's so kind and loving. So Thursday he did it again. Now the father realizes that he has a problem. He envisions the future of the boy. If today he is stealing one dollar, when he will be 18, he will, be, he will steal 100,000 dollars. So what do I do? Apply justice? Apply correction for him? Or I let him grow wild until the police will take him away in shackles from my home and I will be behind him in tears. So the father says, boy, I told you, I prevented you, don't steal. I have to correct you. He took a needle and the boy is looking scared. The father takes his hand and with his hand, big hand covers his child, the, the, the son's hand. And he starts to pull the needle. The boy says, why is my dad crying? I don't feel any pain. And all of a sudden he looks to the hand of the father full of blood. And the boy is looking to him. Dad, please stop. And the father told him, this is how much I hate your sin of stealing. I promise you, I will never do that again. It was the hand of the father. The father put his hand to protect, protect the hand of the son. You know what the father said? Son, this time... Is my hand. But the time comes when the Lord Jesus will return. And that will not be the hand of Jesus on the cross. will be your hand. Today, the Lord is telling us this. On the cross of Calvary was my hand. But if you don't come back, if you don't accept my love, my grace, next time when I come 
will be your hand. And at the end of the day, it's a choice, brothers and sisters, friends. What do you want? Do you want to change? Do you want to be the one that really, really accepts the forgiveness of Jesus? Jesus is the perfect righteousness. While he does no palliate sin, nor lessen the sense of guilt, he seeks no to condemn, but to do what? Save. You know, I want to ask you the most powerful question tonight. Is forgiveness unconditional, yes or no? It's conditional. You should not see in your enemy but a gun astray friend. If we will treat each other in this way, as this Greek thinker suggested, we will be a better world, a better, a better society, a better family. In reality, you may think, man, I have so many sins. I am the greatest sinner in the world. Do you feel being imperfect, sinner? Do you feel that your characters have some cracks? How do you feel? Is there any holy people around here? I'm not. But the Lord is looking to you and says, I don't care how many sins you have. I love you with passion. Your sins have a provision, the blood of the Son that is called Jesus Christ. Don't care about your sins. What doesn't have a, a solution is my attitude, your attitude, our attitude. Your sin, if you have 5 billion sins, I have 10 billion sins. It doesn't matter. Well, you know what it matters? Your attitude, my attitude. How do I relate with the supreme question of the universe? In the time of judgment, God will look in your eyes, in my eyes, and he will say, leave you. Why? Why did you reject my love? What could I have done more for you to save you? I died with my son on the cross of Calvary. I gave everything. I emptied the universe for you. Why did you reject my love? Ladies and gentlemen, is there a more complicated question than this one? Why did you reject my love? For some of you who were here last night, I talked about my father. Do you remember? How he took the Bible and slapped me on the hand. My mom received Jesus Christ after a few years I got married. But my father, no. I struggled with him. I tried to be, to convince my father to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in his life. He was drinking heavily, smoking since he was four, uh, uh, in the fourth grade, grade. And he was slave of his own vice. He could not give up. He was eating. He was very uh, meat-oriented. And uh, in 2014, I remember I received a phone call from my mom. He was in the hospital, 72 years old at that time. And she says, my mom says, leave you, come home, because he's dying. I was in Florida. I took a flight, went to Europe, Romania. And I wrote a letter to a friend of mine that I knew that is in the city where he was hospitalized. And in that letter... I wrote the most beautiful words I could ever write to swam someone dear to me. I said, Dad, you are my hero. I love you so much. Stay alive. I'm coming home. In those moments when I wrote that letter, I had all the regrets in the universe because I did not spend more time with my father. I was in all continents in this world. I was traveling, baptizing all kinds of people from different cultures. And I fell miserably to help my dad receive Jesus. And I wrote all those things, all those regrets in the letter. I said, go to the hospital and read. For some reason, my friend did not get the email. Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, my father passed away. He never got my words. I reached the time when the funeral occurred. I took the letter and I wrote to my father, the words that he could never hear. I will never forgive myself for the fact that I had one single man that I loved and I failed miserably. What kind of a pastor I am if I could not convince my dad to receive Jesus in his life? 
if there are some of you who still have parents alive, and if you want to say something to them, say it now, because tomorrow you will deeply regret, trust me. You will regret. If you have mothers alive, if you have fathers alive, if you have both parents alive, say something to them. Good, bad, as you think they were. They were your parents. Oftentimes they took the bread away from their mouth to feed you. They did that by sacrifice. And my final appeal to you tonight is parents, save your children. Children, save your parents. The Lord is coming soon. Here is the terminus point, my friends. Joy, it's a choice. Love is a choice. Peace is a choice. Kindness is a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. And finally, the attitude you have towards his love and his mercy is a choice. I prayed for a son for 25 years. Between my first daughter and my son, there is 16 years difference. I consider my wife as being a hero to have five kids with a man like me. But the Lord gave us a son. And I love him so much. Not I love my daughters too. And I have a cordial relationship with every one of them. In the evening, I will tell my son stories. Do you know what are the stories that the kids love the most? David and Goliath, Daniel and the lion's Pete, those who read the Bible often. So for six months, my son, which is, his name is Daniel, says, tell me Daniel and the lion's Pete. Okay, I will tell him that. And after a few months, I got tired of that story and said, Daniel, do you want to be like Daniel from the Bible? And with one eye closed, he's looking to me, he will stay on my chest. Every night he will sleep on my chest. Oh, I loved him. And he says, when I ask him, do you want to be like Daniel in the Bible? He says, no. I said, you tell me for six months to tell you the, the story with Daniel and, and the lions. And you tell me that you don't want to be like, like Daniel. It's very disappointing. And he smiles to me. He says, dad, I don't know who that Daniel is, but I want to be like my dad. I don't know who that guy is. But you are my hero. I want to be like you. Mothers, how many of you would like to hear these words from your daughters to come to you, not to give you Christmas gifts, but to say, Mom, after so many years, I want to tell you, I want to be like you. How many of you fathers, I would like to ask you, how many of you fathers, will receive the visit of your son and will say, the son will say, Dad, I want to be like you. I think that this is the greatest compliment you can ever receive. Is that true? Tonight, we have to decide if we forgive or not. If we apply the justice or we apply the mercy. But we have to be careful with this chemistry. How we balance mercy and how we balance justice. If we repent, the police people, when the police uh, gets the bad guys, they have a saying in the police world, if you behave like a gentleman, I treat you like a gentleman, correct? So is God. When we receive his call, if you want to give your heart to the Lord tonight, I'm willing to pray with you like the most miserable sinner that was ever forgiven. And I want you tonight to understand that you cannot upset God. You cannot take God by surprise. He knows who you are. He remembers since you were conceived in the womb of your mom. You cannot take God by surprise. He's never getting tired of you. Maybe you think, wow, I went too far to come back to the Lord. But I tell you, Jesus really, really loves you. He loves you more than you can imagine. And that's why tonight I make an appeal to you. I know that we are concerned of our human health, body-wise. We want to be healthy, but I want to tell you, there is no health, perfect health, without the health of the mind and the reconciliation of our heart with the Lord Jesus Christ. We may be healthy. We can eat vegetarian food like the elephants, live an extra hundred years, but still we die. 
But what I want, I want to live forever. I want to live with you in the kingdom of God. When we will go through the celestial galaxies and we be with Jesus Christ, his smile is the best music you ever heard. His voice is the best lyric of that music. Try to meet Jesus at least a few minutes tonight. Talk to him like a friend. Recognize in him a better version of you. Accept him in your life. He will heal your wounds. Tonight, before we pray, if you wish to pray with me, I want to I wanna make an exercise of our mind. I want you to memorize with me one Bible verse. One. Is that a lot? Come on. We stay in the platform, Facebook, Instagram, whatever we have, TV. One Bible verse is the most beautiful Bible verse from the Old Testament. Is Jeremiah 17 verse 14. Jeremiah 17 verse 14. And this is the story of Jesus. This is basically the conviction and the definition of the paradox of forgiveness. In fact, uh, for those who are reading the Bible very often, I want to tell you guys, and I conclude, chapter 17 in the book of Jeremiah is the ugliest chapter for humanity because it speaks a lot of evil things about us. Oh, your heart leave you is deceitful. You are evil. You cannot trust your feelings. You cannot trust your heart. Ugh, who wants to read Jeremiah 17? And yet, in that chapter, there is a pearl. There is a diamond. One single Bible verse that turns the world of your mind and your heart upside down is Jeremiah 17, 14. I want to share with you this Bible verse. And then, if you wish, we can repeat together and pray and go home and come back tomorrow evening. Do you agree with that? What Jeremiah says in this Bible verse, Jeremiah 17, 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, O Lord, and I shall be saved. Because you are my glory. Is that a beautiful Bible verse? He is the great healer. Jesus is not healing by force. He is healing, asking you, do you want to be healed? The entire generic of our subject for this week, do you want to be healed? Jesus is a gentleman. He does not force us any medication against your will. The world does. So I want to ask you, would you be so kind to repeat with me? This Bible verse, man, I trust you are the most intelligent, brilliant minds I ever met. You are the revelation of God tonight and he loves you and he wants you for him. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, O Lord, and I shall be saved because you are my glory. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we kneel with our being before the eternal of grace, with our hearts, with our being, with everything that we have. Miserable as we are, racks of this world, we see you in your beauty and we have nothing to impress you tonight. We have a lot of regrets, a mountain of sins on our shoulders. And tonight we come to ask you forgiveness. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, which is so unique and unreplaceable friend and savior of ours. Tonight, I pray for every single heart that is here. I pray for all these souls that are here. And I hope that in one day, together with their families, their parents, their sons and daughters, their husbands, their wives, all the friends. And why not? We pray for our enemies as you taught to do so. Heavenly Father, please touch our hearts and help us to melt ourselves and hide ourselves in the beauty of Jesus Christ. Tonight, we want you to call our, uh, your presence in our home. Tonight, we, we want you to forgive our sins and help us to forgive our enemies, to forgive our debtors. Produce in us a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit. We love you. We miss you. And we want to stay with you forever and ever. Amen.
I thank you so very much for tonight. I hope that uh, tomorrow we meet again. God bless you all. Don't forget Jesus loves you.